Welcome everyone to today's TDL member forum for October 2022. Hope everyone is enjoying cooler temperatures today. I know I am here in Austin. My name is Christy Park and I'm the executive director of the Texas Digital Library. I'm so glad everybody's joined us today. As I welcome you to this shared virtual space, we will start as we normally do by acknowledging the physical places from which we are joining, all located on the indigenous lands of Turtle Island, the ancestral name for what is now called North America. TDL staff work fully remotely and we all join from our own specific places in Texas and outside of it. Um, I join from Austin and the Central Texas area where the Tonkawa were among the traditional stewards of the land before their forcible removal. I invite you to share your own land acknowledgements in chat if you'd like to, and Leah is going to share um, a link where you can learn more about the Indigenous people living in your area, wherever that may be. Here's our agenda for today. I'll Follow, I'll start with some updates and we'll follow the usual agenda, um, highlights on services and projects and some community updates and time for questions at the end. We do have a pretty packed agenda today, so we will likely go right up to the end um, of the hour, but we'll stick around for a few minutes if there are questions or, um, or if there are comments that we, that we want to address. You'll be hearing from me from Courtney Muma, our Deputy Director, and Elliot Williams, our DPLA Service Coordinator, as well as our Communications Manager, Leah DeForest. Okay, so let's move on into a few updates for me, starting with some very exciting news. Um, I want to introduce all of you to TDL's newest staff member, Ima Adwak, who joined us mid-September as digital librarian. I know most of you have already met Ima in one of our user group meetings or interest group meetings or as part of the informational interviews she's been conducting in her first month at TDL. We cannot wait for you to get to know her and work with her over uh, the next few years and vice versa. Um, as TDL's first ACRL diversity resident, Ema will have an opportunity to lead, create, collaborate on, and discover varied aspects of creation, maintenance, and innovation in digital libraries and archives within the context of our communities here at TDL. She will be guiding her own working experiences collaboratively with um, our TDL staff and our members, beginning with several rotations over the first two years at TDL. She's working remotely from Houston, uh, and she's currently finishing up her MLS at the University of North Texas, TDL member. Um, Ema, can you unmute and just say hey to everyone so they can see you? Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. It's nice to see you all. Awesome. Thank you. We're going to put her email address and a link to a blog post um, that she did on our website. Uh, that's on our website. We'll put that in chat and, and, and hope that you'll get to know her better and welcome her to the TDL community as you already have done. We're really excited um, to have Emo with us. Okay, so... A reminder that International Open Access Week is happening next week, October 24th through the 30th. As you know, open access and the conviction that openness creates pathways to more equitable knowledge sharing is foundational to our work at Texas Digital Library. And the theme of OA Week this year homes in on the potential impacts of open access in addressing the existential crisis of climate change. It seeks to encourage connection and collaboration among the climate movement and the international open community. <clears throat> Sharing knowledge is a human right and tackling the climate crisis requires the rapid exchange of knowledge across geographic, economic and disciplinary boundaries. So I encourage you to go to the openaccessweek.org website to learn more about next week's events. And if your institution is hosting an OA Week event or events, um, please let us know, tell us about it in chat so that the um, TDL community is aware. 
Speaking of open, open access, um, most of you are no doubt aware of the big news out of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, this an announcement that came out a couple of months ago now, but we haven't had a chance to meet in this forum since August, so I wanted to make sure to acknowledge it and a little bit about how it's impacting some work that we're doing. Um, this memo from the OSTP issues guidance to federal agencies to update their public access policies to make all research publications, along with the data needed to validate those conclusions, immediately available to the public. And uh, these it, it directs the agencies to develop those policies no later than December 31st, 2025. This historic memo is a significant expansion of the 2013 memo under the Obama administration, which, if you remember, led pretty directly to the development of the Texas Data Repository um, here at TDL. And importantly, this memo removes the optional 12-month embargo that was allowed under the 2013 guidance. It also emphasizes the importance of equity in both the publishing of and access to the record of science. And, um, and I'm quoting from the Spark press release here, it, it underscores the critical role that openness plays in ensuring scientific research integrity, providing important new guidance for the use of digital personal identifiers and robust metadata accompanying articles and data sets. So also important for our collective work here at TDL, the memo seems to require agencies to draft green OA policies, not gold ones. So in other words, they require, the policies will require deposit in open access repositories, not publication in gold OA journals. Obviously we welcome this as very good news. Um, we believe that green OA is, is a crucial pathway towards a fair and equitable OA ecosystem. It also dovetails with some work that TDL is involved with through Spark to advance uh, repositories in the US. So I wanna note that here as well. This US Repository Network Project is an initiative of Spark with support from the Co Confederation of Open Access Repositories or CORE um, and is part of CORE's Modernizing the Global Repository Network Initiative. In that, as part of that initiative, CORE identified the need for assistance in breaking down institutional silos within the repository community here in the US and developing a more cohesive approach and greater collaboration around repositories in the US. And as a well-respected provider of shared repository infrastructure here, TDL was invited to serve on the steering committee that will undertake this work. That committee met for the first time last month and you can read some about um, the areas of action we plan to undertake as part of this initiative on the SPARC website, which we'll link to in chat. But among other things, we intend to seize the opportunity provided by that OSTP memo and the access that SPARC has to you know, these agencies and uh, influencers in DC to influence as much as we can the development of those agency policies that come out of this guidance. Um, to help advance and shore up the repository community and academic libraries working with repositories um, here in the U.S. So more on that as that work progresses, but um, I think good stuff going on. Okay, and finally, before we head into our service updates, I get to share with you um, a question and some feedback that came in through TDL's suggestion box. So. This question was about how much and what type of contact TDL staff have with the deans and directors of our member libraries, with some thoughts about how we might use that access to connect library and archives workers with leaders and administrators. So I'll talk a little bit just generally about what type of communications we have with deans and directors, and then I'll, I'll read directly from the feedback um, about some ideas this person had around this idea or this question, because I think it was really thoughtful and good and might also generate some additional thoughts from you all. So first, generally, how do we interact with deans and directors of our member institutions? The answer is, of course, 
more complicated <laughs> than a straightforward, but there are different levels of engagement at different institutions. Um, at minimum, once a year, um, our regular members send a representative to our annual member board meeting. Um, officially, the representative is the dean or director of the library, but sometimes they assign a proxy um, to, to represent the institution at that meeting. That meeting this year is actually happening next week, next Tuesday on October 25th. A subset of those library deans and directors form our governing board and meets twice a year. And another subset of those folks, three people, serve as our board officers, our chair, vice chair, and secretary. And Courtney and I meet with those three folks monthly or more or less monthly. So we have considerable kind of deep contact with that group, which rotates, you know, um, every year. Beyond those formal regular meetings, we have other more informal ways of engaging. We send out um, opportunities and requests out to our member board through an email list we maintain. Uh, every few years, we try to physically travel to each of our member institutions. Though that has been getting harder to do um, as we grow. And of course, the pandemic kind of threw a wrench into that as well. We also see folks, um, deans and directors at library systems meetings, at TCAL and other meetings every year and maintain kind of relationship through those um, networking opportunities. And we often reach out to them or sometimes to assistant deans um, or library uh, directors with thank yous and letters of commendation related to work that um, some of their staff are doing with TDL. So that's kind of the general overview of, of how we interact with deans and directors. So I'm gonna read now directly from the feedback that was submitted. I've removed some, I've edited somewhat to keep it anonymous, but this person says this, um, outside of board and member meetings, is there any communication or is there room for more communication? Partly as advocacy and support for practitioners and also as part of the education we do so regularly on our work. I've been realizing how it might be unusual for someone's supervisor to not know what they do. So communication with our library deans and directors, but also supervisors and middle management is there a way to target that audience to share our work and also discover and work to meet their needs? I'm curious about brainstorming this a bit, even to have maybe a show and tell at the beginning of board meetings or invite deans to give out awards at the awards ceremony to encourage attendance, invite them to host a panel at TCDL. Just curious if this is a gap we can look into. So I think these are really great ideas and, um, I know I can speak for myself. It gave me a lot of things to think about and consider, and um, it was really generative. And I think it might be for the community um, to think about together as well. We try to, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. We try to highlight the work of librarians and archives to our board in a few different ways. We let them know who's serving on committees and interest groups at TDL, for instance. At the member board meeting, we've sometimes had presentations from member groups about work that's happening. So for example, last year, the committee that organized our Data Carpentries membership spoke to the member board. Um, we try to let individual supervisors know when somebody has done exceptional work on a group or committee through letters of commendation or informal emails that we're not totally consistent about doing that and could probably get better at it. But I think there's a lot more we could do here and think about when it comes to establishing better communication and connection between administrators and the folks we're working with day to day in libraries and archives. And we're considering what we might do at TCDL next year in this regard. So if you have ideas there, love to hear them. And in future member board meetings. And we would really, really welcome y'all's input and engagement on this. If you have ideas or questions, you you can email me or the suggestion box or add something in chat now and we'll be sure to capture it. We're going to have to move on for the moment because we've got so much to cover in this forum, but 
hopefully um, we'll have time at the end today to take any questions or ideas about this topic because I, I really would love to um, hear your thoughts. Even if it's just, yes, this is definitely something I would like for TDL to, you know, step into or uh, and affirm this or, or not, that would be really helpful to know. So please do continue to use the online form that's linked to on this slide if you have other ideas or questions or feedback that we can address and we'll um, we'll get to it um, in an appropriate forum, maybe this one in a future TDL forum. Okay, so we're going to move on into our service and project updates, starting with DSpace. Um, Okay. So we are beginning work to prepare for upgrades of our hosted repositories to DSpace version 7. That's the, the big news. It's not happening imminently. The upgrades will happen most likely in the summer of next year, but we're beginning testing um, and prep in earnest this fall. Um, part of that work is forming a task force made up of TDL staff and members of the DSpace users group that has its first meeting tomorrow. And that group is working with us to test DSpace 7 in our hosting environment and to help us educate the larger TDL DSpace user community um, about differences with DSpace 6 in preparation for the upgrades. So those members include Phoebe Raglan from AM Corpus Christi, Colleen Lyon from UT Austin, Mary Rausch from West Texas AM, Charity Stokes from Texas AM, and Laura Waugh from Texas State, along with Nick Woodward, Nick Lawland, and Ima Adwak, and myself from TDL. So we'll have more updates um, on that work as it progresses, obviously, but we're really excited to get this movement going um, to get everybody into the latest version of DSpace. Other reminders, next, the next DSpace user group meeting is October 25th. Um, and then just a scheduling note in case you missed any emails. The November and December Doug meetings were originally scheduled during holiday weeks, so we've canceled both of those and combined them as a single meeting on December 6th at the usual time. You should have gotten a new Outlook invitation, but you might want to check your calendars just in case if you um, usually engage with that group. And we don't have any updates um, on OJS journals this week, except to say that the next OJS user group meeting will be held November 3rd, and we hope you'll join us if you're um, an OJS user or just OJS curious. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Courtney next to talk digital preservation and Vireo. Over to you, Courtney. Thanks, Christy. Hi, everybody. Courtney Muma, Deputy Director of TDL, um, she, her, hers. Um, last week, I had the first meeting of this new grant that I'm going to tell you about um, alongside the DLF Forum Conference. Um, and so um, we're excited that the education Educopia Institute um, has partnered with six members of the Digital Preservation Services Collaborative, the DPSC. Um, that includes us, AP Trust, Chronopolis, Clocks, Lyricist, and Meta Archive. And this is a grant that we were awarded from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, IMLS, to articulate the need for community-supported, values-driven digital preservation services and develop a design for a future shared service model. By centering a set of shared values that empower communities of practitioners, the project aims to engage in a collaborative, bottom-up process that brings multiple stakeholder, stakeholders into the big tent of planning for the future of digital preservation. You can learn more about the partners in the project at the link that we've provided here in chat. <clears throat> Um, speaking of those values, um, the, the project is based on a set of shared values that the DPC authored um, several years back in 2018. 
Um, and we're expanding that right now. Um, we're asking for feedback from the community. You can use the code on this slide uh, or the link to provide it to access the version that's now open for comments until the end of November after American Thanksgiving. Um, you'll notice advocacy in there, really wanting to support folks on the ground doing that very important advocacy in digital preservation work. Um, I also want to tell you about two NDSA surveys. The first is open now, um, the 2022-23 National Digital Stewardship Alliance or NDSA web archiving survey is open and it aims to track the evolution of web archiving programs in the US and to help the NDSA better understand what individuals and institutions are collecting and the kinds of infrastructure needed to support these collecting efforts. The current 2022-23 survey is meant to be answered by individuals, and so there's no limit on the number of individual responses per organization. You and your organization do not need to be a member of the NDSA to answer the survey either. So please take a look at that. The NDSA Staffing Survey Working Group has published its 2021 Staffing Survey Report, um, which is now available in the NDSA OSF, and we'll put that link in chat. That staffing survey is designed to gain insight into current staffing realities for digital preservation programs and was substantially redesigned in 2021 based on feedback from previous surveys and changes in the field over the past decade. I encourage you to look at the report um, we saw at the DigiPres conference last week in Baltimore, a presentation on the staffing survey. And I think some of the results, especially around the difference between what supervisors see in terms of digital preservation success and what staff who are working in digital preservation see as success is, is fascinating and interesting and I think um, affirming in a lot of ways. Um, finally, I want to remind you all that the Digital Preservation Interest Group is having our quarterly meeting this Thursday, tomorrow, October 20th at 2 p.m. And we will talk about everything I've covered here and, and more. So we put a lot of links in the chat for you here um, for all of those things. Um, next up, I wanted to tell you um, about TDL's participation in an OCLC research project examining collaboration as a strategic choice rooted in the experiences of collaboration to create research data management capacity. Um, so the first part of their report has been published, we'll share that link, and the second publication is due in early 2023 and will include um, the use case interviews of which TDL staff and also members of our Texas Data Repository Steering Committee members were a part. Um, so we've shared a link to the first part, um, library collaboration as a strategic choice, evaluating options for acquiring capacity. Let's take a look at that and we look forward to the next part of that report. Next, um, the TDR Steering Committee has asked a group of its members to review new features and add-ons that are candidates to enable in the next TDR Dataverse upgrade, which is happening in early 2023. Dataverse is always improving and adding integrations, so we look forward to adding some significant improvements to the system. We'll share what we come up with in a future forum. Moving on to Vireo, TDL has added a new TDL affiliate member with hosted Vireo. We want to welcome the University of Illinois Chicago to the TDL membership. Um, they just got their first instance to test in up and running and they're hoping to go live in 2023. And finally, migrations to uh, Vireo are ongoing. Um, there's just been a few setbacks at some of the larger institutions. Um, still, we're on track to have all TDL members move to Vireo 4 by the end of the year, which is very exciting. Um, and we want to thank Frank Smutniak for his hard work on that as well. So now I'll hand off to Elliot to share a few updates about our DPLA aggregation service. Thanks, Courtney. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Elliot Williams. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the DPLA Metadata Aggregation Service Coordinator here at TDL. Um, and before I start my update, I want to say thanks to those of you who I was able to see in person last month. I see several of you are here. Um, I attended the Queer History South Conference uh, in Dallas, and it was great to see many of you at that conference and at site visits around the D DFW area that week. Um, so thanks to everyone who let me come see your libraries and your workspaces, and I hope to be able to visit more of our members in the future. Uh, we have been busily preparing for our fall quarterly DPLA harvest, which is happening next week. As always, the harvest is a chance for TDL members who participate in the 
aggregation service to update their metadata records in DPLA. Uh, and I'm very excited this month that the University of Texas at San Antonio is having their first harvest for DPLA. Uh, UTSA is sharing over 40,000 records with DPLA, including some really, really cool materials. I spent the morning looking through their collections, and it's just amazing. Um, the October harvest should be live in DPLA next Friday, so I hope you'll check in to explore uh, UTSA's materials, along with the records shared by Houston Public Library and Stephen F. Austin State University. We'll also be posting a blog post on tdl.org highlighting some of UTSA's collections, so be on the lookout for that as well. I also wanted to share that I'm hosting a webinar in two weeks on Wednesday, November 2nd. We're calling it the Metadata Support Gathering uh, because we want it to be a place for anyone who works with metadata for digital materials to just get a little support. Um, I'll be sharing some tips and suggestions for creating shareable metadata, and then there will be lots of time to ask questions, share advice, uh, and just talk about whatever metadata related topics you want to discuss. Uh, Leah put the link to register for that in the chat and I hope to see many of you there. And now I will pass it off to Leah. Thanks, Elliot. Hi, everyone. I'm Leah. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the communications manager and OER support service lead for TDL. We are inching up to the top of the hour here. So I just want to mention if you need to go at 11, this is recorded. We have links in our slides and we'll be publishing everything on YouTube and in our, in our um, DSpace repository. And you can always email us if you have any questions or missed something uh, when you need to go. So regarding OER support, I wanna thank everyone again who completed our OER support survey. TDL's OER ambassadors are working on a full report of the survey along with recommendations for our OER support service. We will have an update ready for you at next month's forum and hope you'll stay tuned for our next OER at TDL meeting, which will focus on sharing best practices for getting started with OER publishing with your faculty. Uh, last month, uh, we saw some great things happen at Open Texas, and I wanna thank everyone who joined us for the conference. Our theme of the labor of open education was incredibly timely and very well received. I think we still have much to explore in this topic. We had a thousand people, over a thousand, registered from all over the US, hundreds of attendees, many of whom based here in Texas. And this year's Open Texas Conference really reaffirms the goal set out by my fellow steering committee members that is to say all of us working in open education need this time together to share our work, learn from each other and lean on one another. Uh, I especially wanna thank our 31 committee members. These were led by uh, chairs of, that were TDL members, Heidi Winkler, Justin White, Paul Sharp and Jessica McLean you all made this conference go. Many of the committee members were TDL members. So thank you for raising your hand to help. And we also saw TDL members outside of the roster of committee members to volunteer to moderate sessions. So, so just thanks again for all you did to make this conference such a big success. Work is ongoing. Proceedings will be published in TDL's DSpace. Conference sessions have been recorded and they will be published in YouTube by the end of this year. In the meantime, any registrants can access the recordings uh, via the link in chat, I believe through the end of this week. Um, and please email if you run into any trouble accessing those. So TCDL, I really wanna thank Adrian Shapiro of Texas Women's University and Gabrielle Hernandez of UT Rio Grande Valley for their work publishing all of the conference proceedings and recordings. So you can access the proceedings for TCDL 2022 in TDL's DSpace repository, and you can watch the recordings of all the sessions and poster presentations on our YouTube channel. I also hope that you've received the announcement earlier this month, uh, save the date for TCDL. We will return in person in May of next year. We'll be back at the Commons Conference Center in Austin, Texas, the week of May 15th. Dates are going to be finalized soon, and our committee is going to be sending out the call for proposals in the next few weeks. So lots more to come for our uh, next uh, TCDL. Um, so next week, if you are a researcher, part of a research support team, or just interested in how research works, then we'd love for you to join our next Research Integrity webinar that's going to explore the connection between open access and research integrity. We have a link in chat where you can learn more and find a calendar download, and I hope we'll see you then. Also stay tuned for more info about another presentation with uh, TDL's Research Integrity Series, 
that'll be happening in January. And next month, we'd love for you to join TDL's GIS interest group to learn, learn more about how libraries and academic researchers are using GIS. The Pecha Kucha event celebrates GIS Day as a way to virtually share experiences, plans, and ideas about how libraries and archives are supporting and promoting GIS activities throughout the state. We are also looking for presenters to share your work, Pecha Kucha style, which means talk less, show more, while you present 20 images accompanied by 20 seconds of commentary. So you can learn more about the events, register for it, and sign up to present by clicking on the link in chat. And just a reminder that we have our usual slate of member group meetings for this month and next. We want you to join in as you can. These meetings are open to anyone. And please note that some of the events do require registration, but all of these meetings and events are free. They're open to anyone. You're always welcome to invite your campus partners, any student associates, and any non-TDL member colleagues who might be interested. So again, all are welcome. That's all for me. And thanks everyone. Back to you, Christy. Awesome. Thanks, Leah. And thank you, Courtney and um, Elliot, for those excellent updates. Um, we are a little bit over time, but um, I do want to take time if you're able to stick around to answer any questions or um, take any announcements or comments um, that you might have. Feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to speak or um, enter a question into chat. And while you're thinking about that, um, I'll just remind you uh, about the TDL suggestion box. If you have feedback or, or suggestions you'd like to give to TDL, we hope you'll use that box to communicate with us. Um, and a reminder that those that feedback can be anonymous if you choose to, to make it so. Okay, so Sansi has a, an unfair question to ask with no time left. Um, about the OSTP memo, that plus the changing NIH data sharing policy address opportunities that span several TDL group services and repositories. Um, I mentioned that TDL and groups have been thinking about areas of engagement and curious to know if there are any plans, conversations within TDL to develop programming or information on how various TDL resources engage or address these new policy changes. Boy, that's a great question. And I mean, I think the answer is yes, there are some conversations going on about that. Courtney mentioned that they discussed it in the TDR um, group. I think it would be useful to plan um, to plan some kind of programming, um, a webinar or something along those lines that might cross um, groups at TDL. Um, one of the, one of the things, and, and I mentioned that we're working with Spark through this more national group, um, to address some of these questions as well, but you're right that there is local, more local and regional work that could be done. Um, I would love to, to talk about that. One thing we might do if TDR is planning a webinar, we might look at a cross group webinar where we could talk about how it might impact different services at TDL. That might be one thing we could we could think about. Um, but we are talking about it through our different user groups, like the DSpace user group, the, the TDR user group. But no, no concrete plans yet. Thanks for that question, though, um, Santi. It's a good one. And I'd love to talk about it more with you if you have thoughts. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I'm not seeing typing, so I think we will go ahead and wrap things up for today. Thank you everybody for joining us and sticking with us um, for a few extra minutes. We'll have the recordings available as soon as um, as soon as we can that you can and you can share it and return to it if you need to. Hope everybody has a great rest of October and we will see you in November, um, same time next month. Take care, everybody. <laughs>